all right so understanding tcp ip so everything on technology everything in it world is pretty much on top of tcp ip and so understanding tcp ip is key to becoming an it professional um tcp is actually transmission control protocol uh, while ip stand for internet protocol so both of them go hand in hand uh, so the internet protocol cannot do without transmission control protocol and transmission control protocol cannot do without internet protocol and there are two versions of ip so there is tcp ip version 4 and there is tcp ip version 6 so that is very very important this course will be focusing mostly on tcp ip version 4 and um, we'll talk a little bit of version 6 but the entire internet is still running on tcp ip version 4 so the tcp ip um, is a suite of communication protocol so we use them to interconnect network devices whether it's in a private computer network which is called lan or it's on the internet which is a public network so whether you are speaking or communicating within the wireless network or within the wired network or within the private network or within the public network which is the internet everything is speaking using tcp ip so without tcp ip it wouldn't be possible for you to hear me now and so we actually this class is possible because of tcp ip what does tcp do and what does ip do transmission control protocol this guy is used to reassemble data so it's used to reassemble data so i will explain what we mean by that so you could say reassemble or reorganize data uh, so maybe we use the word reorganize data and um, the ip which stands for internet protocol is used to transport data so if you want to send data from point a to point b obviously you'll be using internet protocol for instance i want to send you a mail um i will be in point a and i'll be sending you a mail you are in point b of course the mail is going to have to leave my pc and it's going to fly over the internet and then it's going to get to you and you check your inbox you see the mail um, is the duty of ip to ensure that this email uh, moves from point a to point b but ip doesn't care whether the mail is still in the right order it was before it was sent out um, or whether it's in a disorganized manner when it gets to the receiving point it's none of ip's business so um, tcp comes in when the mail gets to the other end the tcp will ensure that the content of the mail is not in any way upside down but tcp is going to ensure that the mail is still the same manner in the same way it was at the point of sending uh, even when it gets to the receiving end where the ip ensures that the mail moves that it leaves your pc and gets to my own pc so i could read it and digest it and make some things out of the mail so that's the role of each of these guys the internet protocol makes sure that the data leaves point a and gets to point b and then transmission control protocol ensures that the data still make same sense uh, when it gets to the receiving end you might have something like 192.168. maybe 10.50 right so in tcp ip version 4 which also is known as internet protocol version 4 or ipv4 uh, we actually have decimal uh, separated by dots so here we have 192 which is an example of a decimal and there is a dot before the 168 and there's also a dot before the 10 and then dot before the 50 and so we have decimal dotted notation but for tcp ip version 6 which is also referred to as ipv6 or internet protocol version 6 so they are in hexadecimal which means that we have numbers mixed together with alphabets so here we might have something like 2001 um, colon so i could have 11ab uh, colon uh, maybe two two b four you get the idea so this is hexadecimal where numbers and alphabet are mixed together so that is an example of internet protocol version 6 or tcp ip version 6 and uh, there's only a few countries that are still that are already using this in the world majority of countries in the world still operate in internet protocol version 4. Um, this tcp ip was actually developed by the united states department of defense uh, so the us dod uh, developed tcp ip to specify how computers should transfer data from one device to another device modern day network is built on tcp ip okay so that's like an overview of tcp ip and here we want to quickly um look at uh, ip addressing now as i did mention earlier uh we said that the tcp manages how a message is assembled that is reassembling data or reorganizing data while ip handles transport which is taking data from point a to point b and uh, so let's look at what ip exactly is so i already said that ip stands for internet protocol 
and i've already given you an example of what an ip looks like so something like 192.168. maybe 1.5 would be an example of an ip address so simply put is a series of numbers assigned to each device connected on a computer network any device on the network that doesn't have this number cannot access anything on the network so for your phone to be able to browse whenever you put on your mobile data an ip address will be allocated to your phone so that you'll be able to browse the internet if your phone doesn't get an IP address, then browsing the internet will be totally impossible with your phone. And this IP address are actually unique. What do we mean by that? So here, let's assume that we have a switch. So cables to connect each of our employees' systems to the switch. So let's say down here we have a couple of devices that belong to our staffs. And they all network together. And so because we are using cable to connect everyone, this is not a Wi-Fi network. This should be a LAN local area network. Now, if I want to address the need of this network, let's say I give this system 192.168.1.1, it's not allowed to repeat that same address on another system. So if I give this one again, 1.1, .1, there will be a conflict. So two systems cannot be on the same IP, and that's why you say it must be unique. And the third system will take the next available address, and the fourth system will take the next available address, that is the uniqueness of IP addressing. And so just think of a street. Okay, so this is a street, a butter, and there will be buildings on the streets. Uh, so different buildings, both sides of the street. And we expect these buildings to be given numbers for easier identification of a particular location. So if you live within the street, maybe you're living at number 15. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't make any sense if we have another building on the same street that is also on number 15. Uh, so even if that is possible, then the first building could be maybe 15A, while the second building will be 15B. So the A and B letters will be differentiating the one building from the other. Well, let's say there is no 15A and B, it's just 15. Then it's only one building that should have that number. Why? Because we want to be able to identify one building from the other building within the streets. And the same thing applies here. Think of the switch here as a street and think of the pieces that are connected to the switch as different buildings within the streets. And then we need to give a number to each of the pieces to differentiate this PC from this PC. And so while this one is taking 1.1, then the other has to take something different from 1.1, which is 1.2, just in that order. Um, that is what makes an IP address unique. Just as I explained on the whiteboard, this IP address of 18 is just a series of numbers. But just know that if it's the Internet Protocol version 4, this series of numbers will be separated by dots. But if it's Internet Protocol version 6, this series of numbers will be separated by colon. And then the numbers themselves will be uh, mixed up with alphabet, which makes it hexadecimal. So IP addresses identify and differentiate billions of devices that we have on the internet today, be it mobile phones, iPads, desktop, printers, laptops, etc. Any device that have access to the internet must have an IP address. So and today, uh, you probably may have heard of IoT devices, um, IoT devices like IoT basically is Internet of Things, and we have stuff like smart televisions, uh, smart speakers, refrigerators, home surveillance equipment, and more. All of these devices have IP address. So if you have in your office some doors that have access control uh, mounted on doors where you have to use your ID to tap on the door handle before you'll be able to open the door and pass. So those doors that have access controls, they also have IP address. If that door would also fall under Internet of Things. So apart from the normal regular devices like iPads, phones, laptops, uh, desktop servers, printers, switches, we also have devices like television, etc. that can also be given an IP address on the network. But the point here is that no two devices can be on same IP. It's not allowed. It's going to lead to IP address conflicts. Just to portray what I've mentioned before, if you have a Wi-Fi router, so want to assume in your home, you have something like this that has an antenna, maybe two antennas, or maybe just one antenna. So this thing you see pointing up is an antenna, and we have here another antenna. And so the antenna will be used to broadcast the signals so that wireless devices here, like a mobile phone, uh, iPad, etc., will connect to the Wi-Fi router, and the Wi-Fi router in turn will allocate IP addresses to them. So this one, for instance, is dot four, and this one cannot be dot four, it has to be dot five, this is dot three, and two and one so every system's ip address must be unique now if that concept is understood uh we want to quickly address the need for ip address why do we need ip address uh computers internet of things devices uh printers mobile phones laptops all of them need ip address in order to communicate with one another 
on the internet mm -hmm. and also within the local area network. So the purpose of IP address is to map the web applications to an address so that that web application can easily be located by internet users. If we don't have IP address, we cannot use Zoom. So this class is ongoing using Zoom. We can also use Microsoft Teams, can also use Skype, all sorts of applications available over there. Uh, the point is if IP address is not available, none of this will work. We can send mail, we can go to WhatsApp, chat with people, our friends and loved ones if there's no IP address. So we need IP address to use social media to check our email and to browse the internet. So if you don't have an IP address, none of these activities will work. Let's look at the types of IP address. So we have this IP address divided into two major types. We have public IP address and we also have private IP address. So what makes them different? A public IP address, also known as external or global IP address, is used to communicate between devices on the internet. So if you need to get to google.com now, the IP address that you'll be using to get to google.com or to send an email must be a public IP address. So for two devices to reach each other over the internet, these two devices might not even be in the same continent. They could be in the same country. They could also be in different countries. They could be in the same continent. They could also be in different continent. But the point is, they can reach each other. Why? Because they have public IP addresses. Uh, so public IPs are used for public communication. When our communication are passing over the internet, our devices that are involved in such communication do need to have a type of IP that is classified as a public IP, external or a global IP address, whichever name you want to use. However, a private address, which is also known as a local or internal IP address, is used within a private network. Okay, so private IP addresses cannot be used over the internet. So if we have a LAN, which is a local area network, let's assume that in your home, you have a Wi-Fi router and you have configured this Wi-Fi device where your mobile phone, your smart television, your laptop, all could connect to the Wi-Fi device wirelessly. So there won't be any CAT6, CAT7, CAT8, no cable anywhere. And so you have a printer, a wireless printer, and the printer also connects to the Wi-Fi router. And what that means is that your wireless devices, like your laptop, mobile phones, iPads, they could send their printing material to the printer and the printer could help them print it out. So you don't necessarily need internet for this phone here to access the printer. And that's what we mean by private network. So a network that all the devices can access each other without having to pass through the internet. An example of those kind of network is local area network. All devices within the LAN should be able to access one another without the need to go through the internet. So any type of network where devices on the network can access each other without a need to pass through the internet, that network is called a private network. And in such network, there are specific IP addresses that we can use in setting up devices in that network. And that IP is called private IP address. So just note that the public IP is used to communicate over the internet, while the private IP is used to communicate within a private network, not over the internet. And so who can give us a public IP? Public IPs are provided by internet service providers. Uh, so ISPs, so whichever ISP you are using, if you need to get to the internet, you need to take your staff to the internet, you need everybody in your company to browse, then you have to ask an ISP that is giving you internet that they should provide you with a public IP. Uh, so. The public IPs, we can't just provide ourselves public IP. We need to get it from an authority, and that authority is internet service provider. Or well, if we are to use a private IP address, we don't need to meet an ISP to, before we can use it. So there are specific range of addresses that are made available for the general public to use um, without having to pay for it. And I have to use the word pay for it because the public IP addresses are paid for. And so when the ISPs allocate those addresses for you to you, you of course have to pay uh, for using those addresses, while the private IP addresses are free for all, and so we don't have to pay a dime to use those addresses. All right, so let's look at how we can give our system IP address. How can we assign a PC an IP address? So that's what we want to look at now. For static IP address, um, an IP address that is manually configured on a device by the network admin is a static IP. So you can, as a network person in the company, um, ha handle the responsibility of assigning each device in your company's IT network an IP. So this can be done manually. I'll give you an example. So if I go to my search on my PC and open my CMD, which is command prompt, uh, on the command prompt, I can go to ncpa.cpl. And when I hit the enter key, it takes me to where I can configure this my system with an IP address. 
and so if i want to assign any of this ip so you could see if you are on wi-fi yeah you i'm presently i'm using a wireless network so my, the wi-fi will be the adapter i'll be using to connect to the network otherwise if we are using cable to connect um we'll be using an adapter called ethernet so let me just use this as an example uh this one is my virtual box um host only network adapter if i'm to give it an ip address i'll have to double click on it i'll have to go to properties i'll have to navigate to internet protocol version 4 so you could see tcp slash ipv4 of course if i go down you will see internet protocol version 6 which is tcp slash ipv6 but most of the time we'll be using internet protocol version 4 so you select version 4 select properties once again and this is where you'll be typing the ips that you want to assign to your system and so we could give one system 192.168 maybe 56.1 we'll have to fill in the boxes here don't worry about these boxes as we go ahead in the class you see what we need to fill in which of the boxes uh, so once you fill everything up here you click on ok you have to go to another system and you have to repeat the same process on that second system uh, maybe that second system will be 192.168.56.2 and you go to another system that will be 56.3 and another system 56.4 56.5 you continue that way until all the systems in your network is given an ip address so this could be tedious sometimes depending on the number of systems we have on the network right so if i have like yeah. a thousand devices on the network uh, this would be a nightmare doing it manually uh, so when we have thousands of devices we cannot afford to address their ip need uh, manually so when we are the one going from one system to the other addressing their ip address need by typing it manually in there that is called static ip address mm -hmm. sometimes that is not feasible so if i have 2000 employees who so are looking at 2000 devices on the network there is no way you will be the one going from one system to the other and give all the 2000 devices their own unique ip address uh, that's um, an impossible mission so what we can do is leverage on a server called dhcp you don't need to bother yourself about these terms we'll be breaking down this in our subsequent uh, class and um, we'll also be learning how to set up all of this stuff so a dhcp as you can see here is it stands for dynamic host configuration protocol so a dhcp server is a server simply put a server is a machine right like a central processing unit just think of mainframe computers that have more processing power than the likes of our desktop and laptops and that those are called servers and so in that server we could go to the server and say you know what we have 2000 devices on the network and we want you to help us assign these devices their ip configuration parameters and so the server is going to say okay not a problem i can handle that uh, so we are going to tell the server that we want you to start from maybe 192.168.1. maybe 50. and we also have to tell the server where it should end all right so the range we are configuring for the server will basically depend on how many devices that we have so you might have 1.100 here so server can start from 50 and stop at 100 it means that from 1 to 49 will not be touched by server so we can actually specify certain parameters and server will now automatically hand out ips to all the systems we have on the network uh, in a matter of seconds all the systems will get all the configuration that they need from the server and that's what we mean by dynamic ip address so when the IP address is not configured by humans, when server is used to ensure that every system on the network get their own IP, that is called dynamic IP because that IP was allocated to that system automatically or dynamically. Or when humans are the ones pressing the keyboard and putting this IP manually from one system to the other, that is called static way or manual IP address assignment. That is two different ways of giving systems IP. I know uh, for sure that the Wi-Fi router is the one handling ip address assignments to your phones to your laptops to everything you have at home you are not the one configuring those devices with your ip and okay. the reason why is because the isp that supplied you that router the engineer was sent to your home to set up the router and what part of the configuration that he did inside that router is to configure a dhcp server so that any device as long as you put your wi-fi password in that device it gets its own ip configuration parameters automatically from the router which is now acting also as a dhcp server i just showed you some this some time ago uh, where i have to open my command prompt i have to type uh, cmd in the search so if i open cmd in the search cmd and hit the enter key how would you know what ip address your system is using to browse the internet the moment you type cmd and the cmd opens cmd is a short form for command prompt here you could type this command ip config make sure there is no space between ip and config and that is ip address configuration so once we type ip config we hit the enter key here you could see what ip i'm using to browse 
And mm -hmm. you could also do this in your own system to be able to locate what IP your system is using to browse. So we we'll have to look for wireless LAN adapter, Wi-Fi, right? Because we are connected to a wireless network. Under it, you are going to see IPv4 address. And on that line, you are going to see I'm using 192.168.43.80. Okay, my default gateway is 43.141. Uh, don't bother about what is subnet mask, what is default gateway. As we move further in the course, you will get the, uh, um, the meaning of those terms. But as it stands now, you should be able to check what IP address your system is using to browse the internet. So just go to the search box of your system and type CMD. The CMD opens, um, have to type IP config. And that's actually, that output I showed you now is what you are seeing here on the slide. So here is my command prompt that I embedded into the slide, which I just showed you now. And the command I typed is IP config. How did we bring out the command prompt? Open the command prompt on your laptop by typing CMD on the search box. The CMD pops up inside the CMD, type IP config, and then locate your PC's IP. As you can see here, this is the, the actual IP of this particular system. 192.168.43.80 and this is under my wireless LAN adapter Wi-Fi. We'll look for IPv4 address. Okay, so Perfect. Yeah. that IP that I showed you is called mm -hmm. private IP address. So the ones we use to communicate within our homes. Okay, that will be totally different from the one that you'll be using to talk to me now. Like the one you use to connect to this Zoom meeting will be different from yeah. the one you will see inside your laptop. So the one you are using to connect to Zoom is called public IP, as we discussed earlier. But the one you are using yeah. within your home to access your printer, access your devices within is called private IP, which I just showed you how to see. Uh, open a command prompt and type IP config and locate it. But you want to see the public IP, you have to go to Google. So just go to Google and just on the search box for Google type, what is my IP address? So if you could yeah. open up a Google, uh, let me just see if I can lay my hands on Google. And let's ask Google what is what IP am I using to talk to you to browse on the internet? What is my IP address? Feed the enter key. You could see what I'm using. Uh 102.89.34.131. Yeah. Who gave me this IP? My ISP. You notice what I said in the slide earlier that a public IP is given to you by internet service provider for you to be able to communicate on the internet. While private IPs are used internally for devices to communicate on a private network. Okay, so I've shown you how to check out your private IP using command prompt. And then to check out your public IP, you have to go to Google and ask Google to show you what your IP is. And as a matter of fact, if I click on this link, what is my IP address? You're going to see some wonders. Uh, you're going to see what ISP gave me that IP address. Uh, so you could see my ISP is MTN Nigeria Communication Limited. And uh, you see the part of the country, the region that they have their office that is providing me this coverage, right? So yeah. is this is the IPv4 that they give me to use to browse on the internet. That is totally different from what I'm using to communicate within my private network. And they are not uh, giving out IPv6 yet. So you could see Internet Protocol version 6 not detected. So what they are currently using is version 4. Okay, so... Um, let's get back to the slide. And uh, so you should be able to check both the private IP and the public IP that your system is using. And um, I just showed you how to do that. So this IP address we've been talking about, there are classes of IP address, uh, uh, talking about IPv4. So let's look at classes of IPv4 address. We have five classes of address. This is class A, this is class B, and class C. As a matter of fact, as a network engineer or an IT professional, you need to master A, B, and C. Those are the more important classes of IP that you should know. We don't need class E because it's used in scientific research. And we're not, um, we not going to the moon. We are not uh, scientists. We are network engineers. We are IT professionals. And so we don't need class E. Class D is used in multicast transmission. And so what do we mean by multicast transmission? Think of video streaming, think of video conferencing. Okay, so those two activities are known as multicast transmission. So if you want to set up a video conferencing equipment for FM, the IP you'll be using should fall under class D of IP addressing. The ones we use in normal network setup, like connecting branch offices together, making sure that everybody in your company is browsing the internet, making sure that your laptop, your printers, all the devices you have on the network, your switches, they all have um, IP address, including your wireless router. Those networking setup can be on class A, class B, or class C. So for your normal day-to-day -day networking activities, you can use class A, B, or C. Class D is used occasionally when we are setting up video conferencing equipment, and we don't even use class E at all as is reserved for scientific research. So right. let's take some information about these classes of IP. Um, here you are going to see that class A range is from 1 to 126. 
uh, class B is 128 to 191, and class C starts from 192 to 223. Uh, what I want you to go away with in this section of today's class is that you should be able to look at look at an IP address and tell which class the IPA belongs to. Let me go to the website again where I showed you um, what my public IP is. So you could see that this IP started from what? 102, right? So yes. um, looking at 102, that tells me that yeah. this IP belongs to class A. How do I know that mm. it belongs to class A? Because how it started, the first numbers. Okay. So now let's um, look at the slide once again. Now, you see that class A starts from 1, right? So what right. do we mean by that 1? Um, let me bring up the whiteboard. Class A starts from 1. That 1 actually means 1.0.0.0, 2.0.0.0, 3.0.0.0, .0, and it goes on until we get to 255. Uh, sorry, it's not 255. It's 1 to 126. So we have to, the last should be 126.0.0.0. That's what we mean by 1 to 126. Okay. So I thought like your IP address, it started with the class B because it's like 102, was it yours? If I'm not mistaken. 102.89.33.120. Yeah. But class B started, oh, class B already started 128. Okay, got it. Yeah. So class A will go all the way to 126. So my IP address started with 102. Mm-hmm. Of course, before you can get to the last, which is 126, you must have reached 102 before you get to 126, which means that this 102 belongs to class A. Got it, yeah. So what you used to know, which class an IP belongs to, is look at the, the first number to the left before mm -hmm. the dots. That tells you the class. Oh, okay. That's the trick. Okay. Yes, is read from left to right. Just look at the first number to the left. That tells you the class. Okay. So for the fact that the first number to the left is 102 and 102 falls within the range of class A, which is 1 to 126, then this should be a class A IP. Yeah. So what if we have something like this? 150.5.10.100. Class B. It's class B, sure, sure. Yeah. From 128 and ends at 191. Oh, and correct. before you can get to 191, you must have passed 150. Yes. So... All these ones we have here, what class do they belong to? 192.168.1.2. That, that belong to class uh, C. Sure. So we know why there are ranges. But did you notice anything, any omission in this table? If you look at class A, it starts from under the range. It starts from 1 to what? 126. Class oh, B yes. starts from 128. One, so what happened yeah. to 127? I guess it's not important. Okay, it's not important, right? <laughs> Yeah, this 127.0.0.1 is used for loop back test, self test. Now, if we are using class A network, um, the total number of devices or end users that are supported is over 16 million. So on a class A network is a massive network. It, it contains up to 16 million devices per network. So as a matter of yeah. fact, here is 16 million, 777,214 devices. Uh, that's what we mean by number of hosts. That term here, host, Simply put, is any device on the network that has an IP address is called a host. Mm -hmm. So this host can be your printer, host can be your mobile phone, host can be your switch, host can be your laptop. As long as the device is assigned an IP address, it becomes a host. If it's a smart TV and the smart TV connects your Wi-Fi, it means that the smart TV must have been given an IP by your DSP server. And that means that that smart TV becomes a host. Hosts are actually devices. And so when we say number of hosts, we are meaning number of devices that can be given an IP address within a class A network is 16,777,214. Mm. That's a massive network. And okay. devices that class B network can support is 65,534 devices. And then class C network is the smallest. It supports just 254 users or devices on the network. Okay. So if you look at the use case or the usage of these networks, you can see that class A is meant for large network. Think of ISPs, the likes of Verizon, Comcast, AT&T, uh, Vodafone, all these, these are giants. These are telecommunication giants and they have millions of subscribers around the world. And so this guy should be on a class A network. So class A is used mostly by telcos. And so when we say telcos, we mean telecommunication companies, telcos or internet service providers. These are people that use class A. Mm. And class B network, which supports 65,000 plus devices, is used in medium-sized network. 
And so think of financial institutions like banks. Think of some universities, some federal universities. They are quite not a small network or mid-sized network. And so they should be on a class B network. Class C network is for a very small network. Think of a, a business center. Think of some small hotels. I just have a little Wi-Fi where people that lodge can have access to the internet. Um, these are examples of small network, a business centers where people can walk in and browse the internet, print and all that. Um, cyber cafe, more like these are small networks. The network you have at home that interconnect all your devices together also fall on that small network. Okay. Now, the criteria that we use to know which class, either class A, B, or C, that we should use to set up a network for an organization depends on the number of devices that the organization wants to set up. So an organization that has procured maybe 1,500 computers and we have been hired as IT consultant to network these computers so that they'll be able to share information and resources, 1,500, that is far way higher than what a Class C can handle. So a Class C can handle 254. In this case, we want to set up 1,500. So of course, we should be looking towards the direction of Class B, which supports up to 65,000. Yeah. Okay. So if I want to set up a 50 devices for a customer, uh, 50 devices is way too small to place under a class B network. So class C can conveniently handle uh, 50 devices. And so the IP we'll be using will be something like 192.168, all those kind of class C IP. And that's what we'll be using to address this network need because they just have 50 clients. So it doesn't make any right. sense to go and use class A, which supports up to 16 million users, and use it to set up a network of 50. What happens to the remaining IPs that will not be used? They will be wasted. Correct. So um, that's how to know which class to use to set up a network with them of a customer. We have to ask them some questions. What are the devices that you guys want to network? How many are they in number? So some few questions will help us to uh, know what class of IP to use to set up the network for them. Mm, that's really good. All right. So yeah, yeah, good to understand the, dif the difference. Yeah. So the class D, as I mentioned, is not for setting up hosts or setting up um, users. This is for special use case, uh, video conferencing, video streaming use cases. And that's why there is no specific amount of devices attached to it that it can handle. And as I mentioned before, class D is purely for scientific research. And so it's not available to be used in networking setup. Okay. Now, the at the end here, you see what we call subnet mask. And each of the classes have their own subnet mask. For class A, it's 255.0.0.0 or slash 8. Slash 8 meaning that if we are to convert the 255 into binary, it's going to give us ones into eight places. That's the one, 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 one. Okay, eight ones is the binary equivalent of 255. And so why we put slash 8 here is to kind of like define how many ones we should have if 255 were to be converted to binary. And class B network has a subnet mask of 255.255.0.0, which 255 equals ones into eight places. And we have two of 255 here, which will give us 16 ones when converted to binary. So we can also write it as slash 16. And for class C network, we have triple 255. So 255.255.255.0, which when we convert 255 to binary, we give us ones into eight places. How many ones are we going to have? 888, that will be 24 ones or slash 24. Okay. Now, what is subnet mask used for? Well, when you have devices connected to each other on the network, the devices cannot know whether or not they will be able to reach each other if they don't have subnet mask. So going back again on the whiteboard, so we have a device here that has been given 192.168.1.1. I have another device connected to the switch and it has been given 192.168.1.2. Now, how would this PC know whether or not it will be able to talk to this PC? They will have to compare each other's subnet mask. So let's assume that this PC here is using class A subnet mask, which is 255.0.0.0. And this PC here is using class B subnet mask, which is 255.255.0.0. When somebody here wants to send a document to somebody using the system, the PCs before they begin to share files will have to compare each other's subnet mask. And if this one subnet mask is only a single 255.0.0.0, and this one subnet mask is double 255.0.0, they are going to say, you know what? I don't think we can talk to each other. After all, our subnet mask do not match. And so they will refuse to talk to each other. That means that they are on different network. And that's the work of a subnet mask. So it helps computers on the network to know whether or not they will be able to reach each other by simply comparing each other's mask. And that is what subnet mask does on the network. Here, I did say earlier that I was going to come back to 127.0.0.0. Uh, so yes. this is the time. So here we have 127.0.0.0, as I mentioned before, is used for loopback. Okay, so it's called a loopback address and um, systems use it for self-test. Packets sent to this address never reach the network. 
but are looped through the network interface card of that particular system that send it out. And so what they're actually doing is to check if the TCP IP protocol stack of that system is working. So the question is, how do we do the check? How do we run the check? Because mm -hmm. we want to check if the TCP IP of your laptop is working. We have to use 127.0.0.1. Uh, so how do we run that test? How do we do the check? So it's very simple. We're going to go to command prompt once again on the search at the bottom left of your system type CMD with a short form of command prompt. Hit the enter key on the keyboard and the command prompt window opens. And I have to do a ping space 127.0.0.1. Hit the enter key. This is good news. Now, why do I say that this is good news? We are actually seeing reply, right? So we are getting a reply from 127.0.0.1. Now, sometimes you might see a message saying unreachable, or you see a message saying timeout, timeout, timeout. But instead of getting unreachable or timeout, we are getting reply, which means that my Wi-Fi adapter on this laptop is working perfectly fine. And also my LAN adapter where a network cable should have connected to on this laptop is also working perfectly fine. Those are the two things we are testing if they are okay in working condition using 127.0.0.1. So... If 127.0.0.1 returns a destination unreachable message, or if it returns a timeout message, it means that mm. our system networking stack is faulty. That system cannot connect to Wi-Fi. That system cannot connect to LAN because the TCP IP protocol stack is not communicating. It's not allowing traffic to pass through it. And that's what oh. 127 is. What, that's why it's not. it wasn't captured in that slide, in that table. Sorry. So it wasn't as if they made a mistake. It just was reserved for a special use case. Here we now want to look at the RFC 1918 address. So RFC 1918 um, is also known as private IPv4 address. We just discussed the classes of IPv4 address where we look at the ranges 1 to 126, right? Yeah. So if class A, for instance, is from 1 to 126, that means yes. we're going to have 1.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. 2.0.0.0. Fast forward to 9.0.0.0.0. We're going to continue that way until we 126.0.0.0. So they are telling us that when we get from 1 to 9, the next number should be what? 10, right? Yes. So look at it here. 10.0.0.0. That's it for class A. It's free for use. Free for use. You don't need to pay any ISP a dime to use any IP addresses starting with 10. Yes. So in class A, we have 1 to 126, but from this 1 to 126, 10 was reserved to be used to set up a private network anywhere in the world for free. You don't need to walk up to an ISP and say, please, I need IP. I want to set up a home Wi-Fi. I want to set up a small network at home. I want to set up a business center. Uh, please, I need that. No. They want to set up a network, even banks, they want to set up internal network or private network that allows their employees to be able to communicate with each other within the banking environment. And they will also be able to send document to printer, make use of the printer, etc. If you want a network like that, which is called a private network, you will use any of these classes, A, B, and C. There are addresses reserved from the pool of addresses that we have looked at here at the top. So here we know that we have ranges 1 to 126. They are telling us when we get to 10 for class A is reserved to be used for free. And in class B, we have 128 to 191. And here they are telling us when we get to 172.16, 172.17, 172.18, 172.19, 172.20, all the way to 172.31, they are all free for use. You don't pay anybody a dime to use any IP starting with 172.16, 172.17, all the way to 172.31. And the same thing applies here for class C. Any IP starting with 192.168.0.0.1.0.2.0.3.0, all the way to 255.0, they are not to be paid for. You have the right to use it and set up a business center or set up anything in your home without having to talk to an ISP. And that's what, why they call them private IP addresses because they are used where in a private network. So mm -hmm. the, the term here, RFC, stands for request for comment. Request for comment, that is RFC. And so this request for comment is just a draft. What is the number of the draft? 1918. But we pronounce it as if it's a year. <laughs> so they have so many drafts that specify how things should be done and how communications can be initiated over the internet. Who created this draft? 
IETF. Who is IETF? Internet Engineering Task Force. So this task force then show that all the devices and all the users on the internet are compliant with the rules and regulations that govern internet communication. And so this particular draft here, 1918, is making it possible that if we are setting up a local area network, either for a company or in our home, or we are setting up a wireless local area network, the IPs we can use in setting those up, as long as they fall from these ranges we put here for class A, B, and C, we don't need to pay anybody a dime to use any IP that falls under this range or ranges. So that's what the RFC 1918. So you might see in the interview, they ask you, okay, about RFC 1918 address. Just know that those are private addresses that are used in setting up a private network. And those addresses cannot get to the internet. And we cannot pay for those addresses in order to use them. They are free of charge anywhere in the world. Okay. All right. So there's another class, which is a class B, um, automatic private internet protocol address, aka APIPAL. So here it starts with from 169.254.0.1 all the way to 169, 254, 255.254. Um, the only thing I can say about this IP is that anytime you see this IP address in your network, it means that you have issues. Okay. So what issue are we talking about? Issue number one. If any system has an IP in your network that starts with 169, it means that you, as network admin, you forgot to give that uh, that system an IP address. Okay, so if a network person forgot to give a particular system IP address, if that system that has not been given an IP address stays up to thirty seconds on the network, the system will come to this block of IPs and automatically assign itself IP. Okay. So the system can automatically configure itself with IP address from 169.254. Why should this be a problem to us? It should be a problem because in our network, we might have decided to set up our network with 192.168. And here we are seeing a system on 169. So of course, 169 is different from 192. It means that those two systems cannot talk to each other. Mm. So when a network person has not given a system IP for at least 30 seconds, the system can give itself IP from this range. Second reason is when we have configured a DHCP server. You remember I said DHCP server helps us to automatically configure our systems with IP address. So if we have a DHCP server and we're expecting that the server is doing the needful, it's helping us to allocate IP to hundreds of devices we have in our network, not knowing that the server is down. So your DHCP server could be down, thereby not being able to hand out IP addresses to your systems. In that case, the systems will still come to this pool of addresses and assign themselves IP without your consent. And that will lead to issues. And that's why I said, anytime you see 169 on any of your system in your network, there are issues that yeah. um, issues have made those systems not to have their own IP address. And so they have self-assigned IP, uh, which is going to cause issues on our network. Okay. So this actually is what TCP slash IP is all about. So we define what TCP is, transmission control protocol using um, reassembling data when data has traveled all the way from source to destination. And we also have IP, which is an internet protocol that is used to transport the data. So it's used for transport, for transporting data from point A to point B. We've looked at private and public IP addresses. We've looked at static and dynamic IP addresses. Static is when we are the one configuring our systems with these IP addresses. While dynamic is when we set up a server to help us handle the IP address configuration. We also looked at public versus private. Public is used in communicating over the internet. Private is used within the private network for system-to-system -system communication. I've also looked at the classes, class A, B, and C, just to ensure that you understand A, B, and C very well. Forget about D and E. D is used occasionally in multi card transmission, which is video streaming, video conferencing. E is, not, e is even a no-go area because it's used only by scientists in making research. And from these classes, they cover out certain IPs that um, we cannot make use of them over the internet, but we can use them within our private network for free. And we just looked at the type of IP that we will have issues with. Uh, anytime we see a system in our network, having this IP starting with 169, we know that is either we have not given that system an IP or we hoped that server would have given that system IP. Unfortunately, the server is down and has not given that system IP. That's only when we have a PIPA address. Mm 